But I'm going to really uh, veer into science fiction and speculate about the far future. That's a bit sort of unwise because one of my predecessors as astronomer royal said in the 1950s that space travel is utter bilge. That was not a good start. But undaunted, I'm going to speculate about space travel and look very far ahead to think about sp space travel by humans and even by post-humans in the far future. Well, Neil Armstrong's One Small Step and the Apollo program was, of course, a heroic episode. And had the momentum of the 1960s been maintained, until now, there would certainly be footprints on Mars by now. But, of course, after Apollo, the political impetus for manned space flight was lost. But during this century, I'm pretty sure that the entire solar system, planets, moons, and asteroids, will be explored by a flotilla of miniaturized robotic craft. And more than that, I'd expect large robotic fabricators in space, making huge telescopes with gossamer thin mirrors, probably huge solar energy collectors, perhaps from material mined from asteroids. But what role will humans play? There's no denying that NASA's curiosity, now trundling across the Martian surface, may miss startling discoveries which a real geologist might not overlook. But robotic techniques are advancing fast, whereas the cost gap between manned and unmanned missions remains huge. So I think the practical case for sending people into space is going to get weaker and weaker all the time. Indeed, as a scientist or practical man, I see no case for sending them. But as a human being, I am an enthusiast. I really hope that some people now living will walk on Mars as an adventure and as a step towards the stars. They may be Chinese. China has the resources the Dirigis government, and maybe the willingness to take on an Apollo-type program. And, of course, China would need to aim at Mars, not just at the moon, because if it wanted to assert its superpower status by a space spectacular, a rerun of what the Americans did 50 years earlier would be a rather poor way to do it. But otherwise, I think the only future for manned spaceflight lies with the privately funded adventurers, prepared to participate in a cut-price program far riskier than NASA would countenance. And again, as people here probably know, companies like Elon Musk's SpaceX will soon offer orbital flights. And there are plans beyond that for week-long trips around the far side of the moon, not landing but voyaging further from Earth than anyone's ever been. I understand that the ticket's been sold for the second flight, but not for the first flight. <laughs> and uh, you can read something into that. <laughs> and uh, Dennis Tito, an entrepreneur and one of the uh, astronauts who paid to go up in the space station, he may not be crazy in planning a similar trip to send people round the backside of Mars and back. This would take 500 days. And he said that the, isolate, the ideal crew would be a stable middle-aged couple because they'd be in isolated confinement for 500 days, and they should be old enough to be relaxed about a high radiation dose on the way. <laughs> and there's another scheme to land you on Mars, but to stay there. The return ticket's too expensive. I would say, when I'm a bit older, I'd like to do that. <laughs> the phrase space tourism should be, I think, avoided by all these venturers, because it lulls people into believing that such ventures are routine and low risk. And if that's the perception, then the inevitable accidents will be as traumatic as those of the space shuttle were. Instead, these ventures must be sold as dangerous sports or intrepid exploration. And don't ever expect mass emigration. Nowhere in our solar system offers an environment even as clement as the top of Everest, or the South Pole. So space is not an answer to the Earth's problems. We've got to solve those here. Nonetheless, a century or two from now, there may be small groups of pioneers living independent of Earth, on Mars or on asteroids. And 
whatever ethical constraints we impose here on the ground, we should surely wish these adventurers good luck in genetically modifying their progeny to adapt to alien environments. That might be the first step towards divergence into a new species. The post-human era could begin in a few centuries. Space travel remains challenging so long as we depend on chemical fuels. Nuclear power could be transformative by allowing much higher in-course speeds. It would cut the transit time to Mars or the asteroids and limit exposure to radiation. And incidentally, it would transform manned spaceflight in the solar system from a high precision to an unskilled operation. Driving a car would be very difficult if you had to program the journey in advance and couldn't make any mid-course steering corrections. But if you had plenty of fuel in your rocket, you could make changes, accelerate and decelerate, and even easier than most travel, you can always see your destination. And so it would be an absolutely, uh, um, absolute doddle to put, uh, go through a solar system if you had enough fuel. And this will happen one day. But even with nuclear fuel, the transit time to nearby stars would exceed a human lifetime. So I think interstellar travel is an enterprise for post-humans, evolved from our species, as I mentioned, by a faster process of natural selection, by design. They could be silicon-based, or they could be organic creatures who had won the battle with death, or perfected the techniques of hibernation for long periods. The first voyages to the stars, whatever they are, will be creatures whose life cycle is matched to the voyage. The aeons involved in traversing the galaxy are not daunting if you're nearly immortal. A thousand years from now, travel to other stars could be feasible. We can't predict what inscrutable goals might drive the post-humans, but the motive would surely be weaker if it turned out that there was nothing very interesting out there, no biospheres. Of course, the European explorers uh, in centuries past who went to uh, Australia, etc., they were actually going into the unknown to a far greater extent than any of these space voyages would be. Because the space voyages would uh, be preceded by unmanned probes and mapping, and although there'd be a time delay, they could communicate in a way that Captain Cook and people couldn't. So they would be uh, going into the unknown, but they would need an incentive in the way that uh, the southern seas provided incentives for terrestrial explorers. And in the last few years, we found evidence that space is much more interesting than we thought it might be before, because we now know that many stars, indeed perhaps most, are orbited by retinues of planets, just like the Earth. These planetary systems have a surprising variety. They're not all like our solar system. But do we expect alien life on these extrasolar planets? Is there life out there before we get there? Well, we just don't know. We know too little about how life began even on the Earth to know whether that was a fluke or whether it's something that would have happened anywhere with a similar environment. And even if simple life is common, it's, of course, a separate question whether it's likely to evolve into anything we might recognize as intelligent or complex. I should mention that uh, I get letters from people who uh, think they do know the answer. They think that there are aliens out there, and they've been visited by them. And uh, I say two things to these people. I say, first, do you really think that if these aliens had made the huge effort to traverse interstellar space, they would just meet a few cranks, make a few corn circles, and go away again? <laughs> and the second thing I say is they should write to each other and not to me. <laughs> well, <clears throat> we don't know if there's any life out there, and in looking for it, it's too anthropocentric to limit attention to planets like the Earth, because science fiction writers have other ideas, balloon-like creatures floating in the atmosphere of a planet like Jupiter, swarms of intelligent insects, nanoscale robots, all these kind of things. And incidentally, I tell my students, it's better to read first-rate science fiction than second-rate science. It's much more fun and no more likely to be wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So we should be mindful that seemingly artificial signals, if we were to detect them, might come from not an organic creature, but from some computer created by a race of alien beings that had long since died out. Maybe we will one day find E.T. On the other hand, these SETI searches may fail. Earth's biosphere could be unique. But that would have an upside, because if we could be less cosmically modest, it would make the Earth more special. And it wouldn't render life a cosmic sideshow. Because the other important point that astronomers know is that there's plenty of time ahead. The Earth is less than halfway through its life, and the universe has a perhaps infinite future. To quote Woody Allen, it turned his very long, especially towards the end. There's plenty of time to come. And so uh, there's plenty of time, if life started in the Earth, for it to spread through the galaxy. And this would make our tiny planet, this pale blue dot floating in space, the most important place in the entire galaxy, as the place from which all this uh, arose. Because post-human evolution, here on Earth and far beyond, could be as prolonged, at least, as the four billion years of Darwinian evolution that led to us, and even more wonderful. Indeed, that conclusion strengthened when we realise, as I've already mentioned, that future evolution will happen not on the slow Darwinian selection timescale, but on a much faster timescale of technological progress, genetic modification, and maybe silicon-based life. So humans are surely not the terminal branch of an evolutionary tree, but a species that emerged fairly early in the overall row call of species, but perhaps one of the special prospects for diverse evolution, and perhaps of cosmic significance for jump-starting the tra transition to silicon-based and potentially immortal entities that can more readily transcend human limitations and spread through the galaxy. Well, in cosmic perspectives, a millennium is but an instant. So let me now fast forward, not just a millennium, but for an astronomical time scale, billions of years. Well, the stars will evolve, and just to warn you, in four billion years, the Andromeda galaxy is going to crash into our galaxy, with a big train wreck, as it were, but it won't actually destroy the solar system. And if we look further away, the external galaxies will accelerate away, and they'd fade, and they will disappear, leaving behind the remnants of our galaxy plus Andromeda and a few other local small galaxies. But within this so-called local group of galaxies, evolution could continue far longer, perhaps long enough for a galactic-scale intelligence to emerge as the culmination of the long-term trend for living systems to gain complexity and, as it were, negative entropy. In principle, all the atoms that were once in stars and gas in our entire galaxy in Andromeda could be transformed into structures as intricate as living organisms or a silicon chip, but on a cosmic scale. But there's another point relevant here. There are intimations that what we've traditionally called the universe, the aftermath of our Big Bang, may in fact be not everything there is. This is an intimation of present physics, but I should have said that if we think of superhuman intelligences, their physics may be quite different. Their knowledge of reality may be quite different, because just as a monkey isn't aware of quantum mechanics, so there may be aspects of reality which are beyond human intellect and will await post-human intelligence, and they may give us an entirely new perspective. So there's nothing special about human brains. There's no reason why we should be matched to understanding the deepest aspects of reality. And one of the things about which uh, we don't know, but which is intimated by our present understanding, is that what we've traditionally called the universe, the aftermath of our Big Bang, could be just one island, just one patch of space and time in a perhaps infinite archipelago. There may have been an infinity of Big Bangs, not just one. Each of these Big Bangs would have cooled down by different, uh, in different ways, perhaps ending up governed by different physical laws. We know that the physical laws are the same in every galaxy. We can take the spectra of light from distant galaxies. It's just the same. But on this far larger scale, there could be a variety of physical laws. And 
just as the Earth is a, is a very special planet among zillions, so on a far grander scale, our Big Bang may also be a special one. And in this hugely expanded cosmic perspective, the uh, laws of Einstein and the quantum could be mere parochial bylaws governing our cosmic patch. Space and time may have a structure as intricate as the fauna of a rich ecosystem, but on a scale far larger than the horizon of our observation. So our current concept of physical reality could be as constricted in relation to the whole as the perspective of the Earth available to a plankton whose universe is a spoonful of water. And that's not all. There's a final disconcerting twist. Post-human intelligence whether in organic form or in autonomously evolving artifacts, will develop hypercomputers with the processing power to simulate living things, even entire worlds. Advanced beings could use these to surpass the best special effects in movies or computer games so vastly that they could simulate a universe fully as complex as the one we perceive ourselves to be in. So maybe these kinds of superintelligence already exist elsewhere in the multiverse, in universes that are older than ours or better tuned for the evolution of intelligence. What would these superintelligences do with their hypercomputers? They could create virtual universes, vastly outnumbering the real ones. So perhaps we are artificial life in the matrix, as it were. Well, all these possibilities, once in the realm of science fiction, have shifted at least into serious scientific debate. From the very first moments of the Big Bang to the mind-blowing possibilities for alien life, parallel universes and beyond, scientists are led to worlds even weirder than most science fiction writers envisage. And perhaps that's a flaky note on which to end today's session. Thank you. Thank you.